بعد الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ما بعد All praise be to Allah. We seek His help and His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil of our own souls and our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides will never go astray. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that I bear witness that there is no, uh, no God worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his prophet and messenger. Uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, today's halaqa uh, will be uh, a very general halaqa, but within it we will have some important points that inshallah everyone in the community can relate to. Uh, when you look at the religion of Islam, you see that uh, Islam is like uh, an ocean. So when you look at uh, Islam, it looks like an ocean. And for many of us, we do not know where to start. We do not know how to begin. And inshallah, today we'll just give some very simple points that we have mentioned in the past, but that we will repeat for the benefit uh, of reminding each other on how to go about practicing the religion. Uh, the first point that scholars in Islam often mention is the point of knowledge and the importance of knowledge. Scholars in Islam have said there is uh, nothing like knowledge and the seeking of knowledge if the person's intention is correct. Why is the point of knowledge so emphasized in Islam? The reason is simple, because every single thing that we do in the religion is based upon this knowledge. Uh, this knowledge does not mean that you have to seek out a degree. You do not have to become a, a doctor with a PhD. You do not have to become a professor. But the simple things, that the Prophet taught us, those are part of knowledge. And the most important aspects of knowledge is the aspect that is related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, because through knowledge, the love for Allah increases. The more you know about something, the more able you are to love it. So if you love Allah and you learn about Allah, and you learn about the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows by studying the religion, how beautiful the religion is, how complete the religion is, your love for Allah will increase. Uh, and the most uh, important aspect of knowledge to start with is the knowledge that pertains to you, that touches you on a daily basis. Okay. So let's say a person Either they are new to Islam or they haven't been practicing Islam and they wish to start practicing. What would be the most important aspect of knowledge for them to learn? Without doubt it would be 
the things concerning the Bahara, purification, and Salah, how to pray. Why? Because these are the things that they will need on a daily basis, consistently. They will need to know not only how to perform the wudu properly, but also how to pray and how to be in a state of purification, in a pure state. Whether that is uh, ghusl or whether that is the wudu, whatever it might be, these things are the most important for a person who is a beginner. And knowledge does not only stop there, there is practical knowledge, the aspect of fiqh that we learn, but also there is the type of knowledge that increases our iman. The study of fiqh, it actually increases a person's iman as well, but there are also stories, uh, the story of the Prophet how he uh, lived, uh, how he spread uh, religion, how he taught his companions, how he interacted with people. And not only the Prophet but the stories of the Prophets. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells us that one of the uh, purposes and aims of telling the stories about the Prophets, of all the Prophets that passed, it is to make the resolve and the heart firm for the Prophet and the companions and the Muslims in general. Because when you read about those Prophets, it increases you in Iman. You see how Yusuf struggled, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him throughout his whole journey. And in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him, brought him to a place that no one could have expected. So this type of knowledge is also important. Uh, so you learn about that and it increases you in Iman. And when you see the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about with your own eyes, you see it in front of you, then it increases you in knowledge and it increases you in Iman as well. And that is part of knowledge. So this knowledge, it should not be thought of as something that is dry, that is in textbooks that you sit and you just memorize, but it should be something that the person uh, longs for, that they want to increase more in knowledge. And obviously the best part of knowledge is the Quran itself, the speech of Allah. And by a person focusing on it, memorizing it, studying it, learning it, uh, and implementing that knowledge, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually increases the person in knowledge. Uh, so that is the first and most important point in Islam. Once a person enters the fold of Islam, becomes a Muslim, that knowledge becomes key. Uh, and we've mentioned the story about uh, one of the past scholars, how he came to a masjid, to a mosque once, and it was after Asr and he was told uh, to stand up. He came inside the masjid and he sat down and the people, they told him, what are you doing? Stand up and pray to Hayat to masjid So he stood up and he did what the people said. The next day he came in uh, and he sat down. Uh, the next day he came in and he started praying like they had told him. But this time they told him, sit down, do not pray now. So I mean, he got confused. The point of the story is he got confused. And he promised himself that he would seek knowledge because he did not want to be confused anymore. And this is the state that we are in today. Uh, you should not just settle to ask someone all the time when it comes to your religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a means for you to seek out the knowledge yourself. And there's nothing wrong with asking someone with more knowledge, but try at least to learn the language, the Arabic language, try to memorize the Quran, uh, try to be someone that can in turn pass that knowledge on. And when we learn that knowledge, uh, the most important aspect of that knowledge is actually 
uh, the second point, which is acting according to the knowledge. Because if you do not act according to the knowledge, then you become like those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has become angry with. That they have knowledge, they know the truth, they know right from wrong, they have received the scripture, they have received the wahi time and time again, but they uh, turn a blind eye to it. Okay, so most important when a person has been blessed with knowledge, and again, that knowledge does not mean that you are you are a sheikh or you are uh, an imam or someone that is big in knowledge. No, the very simple aspects of knowledge, if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires from you to pray five times a day and you do not do that, then you become amongst these people. And it is not knowledge itself that is praiseworthy. It is not knowledge itself. It is the action according to the knowledge. Because if knowledge itself was something praiseworthy by itself, then Iblis would be someone that is praiseworthy, right? Because Iblis, the shaytan, uh, the devil, he had knowledge. He knew who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. But what did he do? He did not act according to that knowledge. He went against what he knew. And because of that, he became a regime, he became an outcast. So acting according to that knowledge, it goes hand in hand with having that knowledge. And why is the knowledge more important than the action? Because without the knowledge, there is no action. If you have action without knowledge, then you basically fall into bid'ah, you fall into innovation. You start creating things that are not part of the religion. Uh, and similarly, if you have knowledge and you don't act according to the knowledge, that is also dangerous and you become amongst those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is angry with. And then after that, we have the aspect of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you notice, there is a succession, there is knowledge, acting according to the knowledge, and then there is calling to that knowledge and those actions. And the preferred way is to follow that uh, line, that succession, meaning that if you are going to call people towards good, towards khair, then you should be the first one to implement it. Okay? It is not always the case. It can be that you know that something is good, but you have a shortcoming. Then it is still required from you to tell people about the good. What do I mean by that? Uh, imagine, for example, someone has a shortcoming, a problem. They smoke, right? They smoke. They know it harms them. They know it's bad for them. But they're addicted. Inshallah, sometime in the future, they will stop smoking. Okay? But right now, they struggle with it. So, does that mean that that person doesn't tell other people that smoking is bad? No. They still have a responsibility. They still, if they see someone else smoking, they can say, yes, I have a problem, I'm working on it, but just because I have a problem does not make it okay for you to smoke. So this is a, a, a concept, a very important aspect of the religion that we call not only to Allah, yes we call to Allah, but we also call towards the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and approves of. Okay? So we try our best to do as much as we can, but we also call towards the things that we cannot do at the moment. Another example is, let's say you hear about the hadith, okay, about when the Prophet wasallam tells us about taking care of the uh, yatim, of the orphan, okay? We know there is a great reward in taking care of the orphan, someone that has lost their father, that has lost their mother, perhaps both. Now, you might not be taking care, sponsoring an orphan, but does that mean that you don't encourage other people? No. You encourage other people and you try to do it.
The bad thing is if a person does the opposite without any intention of improving. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, uh, meaning that do you command other people to do good, to do righteous things, whilst you forget yourself, and at the same time you're reciting the scripture, the book, do you have no understanding? So it is not them the, that they are calling towards the bill that is bad. Okay. Then calling towards good is still good. But the problem is that they do the opposite. Okay. So uh, I hope that makes uh, sense and people understand the point that is uh, important here. So you call to, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves based upon the knowledge and the actions that you do. And when you call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do so in the most beautiful of ways. You try to use hikmah. You try to use uh, that the mawridah should be in a good way. It should be with understanding. You have to understand who you are talking to. Not everyone is on the same level. Not everyone uh, is spoken to in the same way. Ali radiallahu anhu, the famous companion, he used to say, uh, speak to the people in a way that they can comprehend and understand. Do you want them to disbelieve in Allah and His Messenger? No, right? Meaning, for some people, if you mention something too early on, it might become a fitna. It might become a test. They haven't reached that understanding yet. For example, a person accepts Islam, right? they're new to the religion. If you as a born Muslim go to them and you tell them this is haram, this is haram, this is haram, this is haram, and you keep mentioning the haram, the person might get worried and say, oh, there's nothing left that is halal, everything is haram. Right? It doesn't mean that you sugarcoat things, it doesn't mean that you change the religion, but it means that you use the hikmah, that you use the understanding. And you know that people need that uh, wisdom and they need that time. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example. It happened here in the masjid, in our masjid, without mentioning any names. A sister comes into the masjid. She is new to Islam. And she wears the hijab and sometimes her hijab it goes back and it shows her hair now someone else comes up to her without saying hi without saying how are you without even having a conversation comes up to the person and pulls the hijab forward to cover the head now is this using hikmah is this using wisdom and understanding no, it's not. So the action, it might have good intentions behind it. But intentions only take you so far. Well, in order for an action to be good, we have to have two things. The intention, the ikhlas, the niyyah, the sincerity. And also you have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet And if you compare that to how the Prophet dealt with people, that man came in and he urinated in the masjid. Urinated in the masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu he told his companions, let him finish. Let him finish. On top of him urinating, let him finish urinating. And then after that, he called him and he spoke to him in a gentle way. Again, we've said it many times, if it happened today, that person would be banned for life. But yet, the Prophet وسلم, is teaching a whole community, a whole nation, not just the companions, but everyone that comes after the companions. So this is the way that we need to interact. And again, some people, they say, oh, people, they say wisdom, but they sugarcoat the religion and they change the religion. No. 
you have to know the things, and this is why the, uh, the knowledge aspect is important. You have to understand what is the priority. Doesn't mean that you change the religion, but you try your best to accommodate where it is permiss permissible to accommodate. People used to come up to the Prophet This That one young man that said, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to commit zina, that evil act. Now imagine if someone came up to you and said that. They would be put on a blacklist and everyone would be talking about it. Do you know what that man asked me? He said, give me permission to do, do this evil deed and it would spread like wildfire, right? But the Prophet ﷺ spoke to him in a gentle manner, in a way that the person could understand. So again, there are so many aspects, but when do you get that wisdom? When do you get that hikmah? You only get that hikmah through the knowledge that you are taught, the knowledge that you seek. The more you see the way that the Prophet ﷺ interacts, the more you understand how to interact yourself. And hikmah is a very high level. It's not something that is given to everyone. You, some scholars, they say it is not just studying. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants. A person can have knowledge, but they might not have hikmah. So this is a very important aspect, and it is the third aspect that some of the scholars mention, which leads us to the fourth and last <coughs> aspect <clears throat> and that is patience patience this one is actually linked throughout all these three points that we mentioned you need patience in every single aspect of the religion the scholars in Islam they say patience is divided into three parts there is patience when it comes to doing good it needs a patience because waking up for Fajr early in the morning, it might be easy one day, two days, three days, but to keep that up, it needs patience. Similarly, doing any other good, staying up for Isha, again, it might be easy for a week, two weeks, but when Isha gets later and later, it needs patience. And the second part of patience, the scholars, they say, it is to stay away from the haram. Because the soul is inclined towards what is instant, the soul wants instant gratification. So things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, do not do it and wait for the reward in the akhirah, the soul is inclined towards it. So it needs patience to stay away from it. And then the final form of patience is the patience that we often speak about. It is that type of patience that if something bad happens today, we say, someone dies, we are patient. And this patience, it comes to knowledge. Because sitting in a halaqa, when the halaqa is new, when it is announced, something interesting, the first week, everyone comes. The halaqa is full, the masjid is full, right? But to come every single week to sit with the scholars, with the students of knowledge, every single week on a consistent basis, that takes patience. You sit for one week, two weeks, and then suddenly there's 10, 20, 30 different excuses that comes up. And similarly with the actions. It needs, it needs patience. It's because the consistency part is what is difficult. And calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that needs patience. That needs patience. Because what happens is when you call people to Allah, people will go against you. People, not only will they go against you, but they will speak bad about you. This is the, the sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about throughout all the prophets and messengers that have been sent. 
If you look in the Quran, every single prophet that comes, what happens? They say, Sahirun or Majnoon. This person is a magician or he's a madman. They speak ill of the prophets. Anyone that comes with khair, with good, he, they, they even say, I do not ask you for any ajr. I do not even want any money from you. But yet, they speak bad about the Prophet. So, if you do the, the, the deeds, the actions of the Prophets, what will happen? Same thing will happen. People will oppose you. They will say, oh, this person only does it to show up. This person is not sincere. Do you know what this person does? And so on and so on. And they will speak bad. So there needs to be patience. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam time and time again in different chapters in the Quran. Wasbir nafsaka ma'alladina and have patience with those who call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And almost in every chapter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have this uh, uh, jamila, to have this beautiful patience. Okay. So these are the four uh, simple points uh, and for some of you you might have uh, realized that we have those points on this uh, banner there to my right uh, and again it is not something that is set in stone it is just some ijtihad by some of the scholars in Islam that they look at the most important aspects of the religion and they have come to mention these four points. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It is again not like Arkan of Islam or Arkan of Iman or something that has been explicitly, explicitly mentioned by the Prophet but no one can argue with the importance of knowledge. No one can argue with the importance of acting upon that knowledge and the da'wah calling other people towards that knowledge and the patience that is required. And it could be possibly, if Allah Azza wa Jalla blesses you with knowledge, that you might add uh, a fifth point or a sixth point, point, and you might increase and make it ten points. And there's nothing wrong with that. But to keep it simple and to keep it straightforward, some of the scholars mentioned these four points. And inshallah, if a person focuses on these four points when it comes to uh, the religion, you will see that uh, there will be a lot of blessings coming your way, especially that last fourth point, the patience that you have uh, with the, uh, the problems that you might face. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, and inshallah we will conclude with this, uh, in Surah Ankabut, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, uh, do they think, do, do people think that because they say we believe that they will not be tested? Because they say, they say we believe that they will not be tested? SubhanAllah, that's, that is such an uh, amazing ayah that if you only think about it, how many people have started practicing? How many people have accepted Islam only to go through a very difficult time? Only to find the, those that they thought were closest to them, shun them, push them away, their own family members saying, oh, you're a Muslim now, I don't want anything to do with you. Right? Or they, stop, they lose their job or something happens. And as a Muslim, you remind yourself again and again that all this is a test. This hayat in dunya will come to an end. And the question is, do you want this hayat in dunya, this world, or do you want the akhirah? Because if you want this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran itself that whoever wants this dunya, this hayat in dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them this hayat in dunya. If you want it, you can have it. But know that in the akhirah, you will have no khalaq, you will have no portion in the akhirah. But if you ask about, if you want the akhirah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually tells us in the Quran, whoever wants the akhirah, we will give them the dunya as well. 
Ketemu hal di dunia ada akhirat juga ada. Allah Azza wa Jalla sesi dalam Quran, man amila salihan min dzakarin atau unta, fala nuhiyannahu hayatan tayyibah. That whoever believe, whoever does good, man or woman, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has said that they will live a good life. Does not mean that you live an easy life, but a good life, a life that is good here that prepares you for the akhirah. And inshallah, with that we will conclude uh, today's class.